Welcome back everyone to another reaction video. Well, it's time to go back to Attenshay Films Checkmate Lincolnites series. I've done a number of those videos already. I'll put links in the description, not only to this video, but to all of my other reactions to the Checkmate Lincolnites series, if you haven't seen all of those. So check those out. Um, typically, these end up a little bit controversial, which I always thought was interesting because I agree with 90% of what he says in these historic videos. Uh, the only one I've really ever taken exception to him with was his one about gods and generals. And... I have learned the hard way that there are few uh, channels who have as rabid a fan base uh, in support of their man as Atten Shea does. So I'm fully prepared to receive your wrath if I disagree with him on anything. But I think, by and large, I'm going to agree with him. Uh, his takes on the Civil War, I think, are pretty well on. Uh, I agree with most of it. So we'll see what he has to say. I haven't seen this video yet. Tariffs and taxes, the real cause of the Civil War. I think it's a minority opinion, but I do get the occasional comments from people telling me it wasn't about slavery, it was about finances, it was about tariffs and taxes. So I know the people are out there who feel this way. I don't fully understand. I do understand it. I don't... I, I know why people argue that, because they want it to be about anything but slavery, but I don't get it. Anyway, let's dive into this one. I'm kind of afraid to he even hit play because I don't know what's going on <clears throat> in this. Im Let's just get past it. Really, Sean? Yeah, come on. Give me a kiss, big boy. Ooh, you're making me wet. <laughs> hey, what's up? Now, Toon Shea, sir, it is time to make another episode of Checkmate Lincolnites, our wildly unpopular internet show. No. Man, our no. wildly unpopular internet show. I'll give him credit for this. First of all, he he's obviously knows what he's doing when it comes to editing and things like that. And, and the acting skills are, are pretty good with his kind of, um, I don't know what you'd call it, uh, the Confederate character. You know, he's kind of a caricature. I am done talking about the Civil War. Oh, come on now, so everybody wants you to do it. I don't care. I used to think that my Civil War videos could do some good, you know, but nobody's minds are getting changed. They either think I'm a Yankee butthurt soy boy or the second coming of hippie Jesus. Hippie Jesus. You know, there's some people out there who call me a bread tuber. Bread tuber? Does that refer to Vino Farms early content? No, apparently it's just liberals who make YouTube videos. <laughs> Well, that's the silliest thing I've ever heard. I know. I'm just so over it. Oh, oh come now, sir. Well, that's no fun for anybody. No, no, no. I mean it, man. I'm done. Just let me make my weird homoerotic Nazi videos in peace. Jesus. I'm sorry you feel that way, sir. I, I suppose I'll have to do it myself. And I can tell everyone how the war of northern aggression was fought over tariffs and taxes. <laughs> That'll get him. I'm on my way. Having a little trouble with the Jack Daniels. Must not be much to talk about because he's got a lot of fluff in this one. What you got there? Oh, uh, it's just a delicious bottle of Jack Daniels. I Their apple whiskey is fantastic, by the way. Just saying. I'm playing the whataboutism drinking game. The whataboutism drinking game. If you try to divert the conversation by pointing out something bad the union did, I take a drink. That's ridiculous. You Yankees do that just as much as we do. Checkmate, Lincolnites. The program where we annihilate academic historical consensus in favor of true history which my grandpappy revealed to me one Lee Jackson day after he had consumed an entire 12-pack of Natty Light all by himself. Tonight, we shall reveal the true reason for Southern secession. Preserving slavery? Yeah, Civil War was fought over slavery. Not that the South is paying 80% of the taxes Stop, of the they were not. Nation. What? what? Somebody actually believes that's true? Come on. 
At the time, there weren't even that many taxes being paid. Most of the federal government's income was from tariffs and from um, just the revenue of the ports, like the Port of New York. That's why uh, the the head of the ports uh, in New York was such an important federal position that was given out because they had so much power over a lot of the revenue. This is before income taxes. Uh, and, you know, a lot of places don't even have, you know, I mean, there were taxes on things like whiskey and uh, sin tax, we would call it today. But <laughs> Cat got your tongue. Can't think of one of y'all pithy comebacks. No, I'm, I'm just trying to process what you just said. Uh, so that's not true. It's not even close to truth. No. It's not in a 50 mile radius of truth. No, absolutely not. Like if you dropped an atomic bomb on truth, what you just said wouldn't even have radiation burns. See, in the days before the Civil War, income taxes, property taxes, sales taxes, those weren't really a thing. Yep. So when you're saying taxes, you're referring to tariffs on imports, yep. which is how the federal government made its money. We actually have a record of most of the foreign goods imported into the United States just before the war in the annual report of the Chamber of Commerce of the state of New York. The report shows that from July 1859 to June 1860, $233.7 million worth of foreign goods were brought into the port of New York, of which $203.4 million were subject to tariffs. During that same time period, all other American ports combined took in just 128.5 million. So that's what I'm saying. We can't overstate the power that New York holds at this time, the Port of New York, because almost all the federal government's revenue is coming through the Port of New York. And so, you know, like a lot of things, and I'm sure he'll get into this, Everything's north versus south for the first 80, 90 years of the country's history. Uh, and that includes arguments over tariffs. There was a tariff bill that was passed in 1857 that was very favorable to the south. And that led in part to the panic of 1857. Uh, because there's this kind of back and forth going on between goods that are being produced in other parts of the, of the world and imported into the United States and the goods that are being produced in the United States. And the U.S. is trying to become more and more self-sufficient so it doesn't have to rely on goods from other countries. But of course, the less you import goods from other countries, the less income is coming in from those places. And so partially because of the building up of industry in the U.S., but also because they're trying to encourage the building of industry in the U.S., this uh, tariff bill is part of the platform of the Republican Party. In 1860, the Republican Party had like 17 planks to their platform, and several of them had to do with reforming the tariff bills. Uh, and it was, I think, uh, Morrill was the one who was responsible for it. I'm, I'm probably getting ahead of myself. Million dollars worth of goods, of which 76.5 million were subject to tariffs. The numbers don't lie. New York merchants were single-handedly paying 63.5% of all the federal government's revenue that year. And it wasn't just some anomaly. New York had provided nearly two-thirds of the government's revenue in the previous five years as well. That city was the government's biggest cash cow by a huge margin, yep. followed only distantly by Boston in second place and New Orleans in third. And New Orleans is the largest city in the South by far. Um, yeah, you'll see in the decades after the Civil War when they start to have reform uh, over what they call the spoils system, which is your side wins, you get all the, the government positions, uh, the spoils of, of victory, so to speak. Um, and one of those key positions was the appointment of the federal revenue collector um, in New York because it was so important to the government. And so there was a lot of potential for corruption in that position because of the money that was involved. Hey, hey, did you listen to a word I just said? The South left because of the moral tariff. The Union killed Indians and exiled oh Jews. Oh my gosh. Look up Judah Stop. P. Benjamin, the Jewish Confederate. <sighs> but why did the Federals fight? The Yankee mercantilism that was gonna be in trouble if the South won its independence. Oh no. They would have a next door competitor charging a 10% tariff compared to the moral tariff of 40%. Now here's what I don't understand about these arguments because the people who will argue these things, even if they were true, which most of them aren't, 
the people who argue these things want to argue that the men who fought for the union were fighting for these things, which is what their government was for, but they don't want to apply the same standard to the Southern government, the Southern government that very clearly made its number one aim preserving the institution of slavery. It's in all the secession documents. It's why the government was formed. As I've said repeatedly, it's not why the average Confederate soldier fought, but it is why their government existed. And the same thing's true in the North. If you're going to argue that these Yankees were all fighting for tariffs and taxes, then you have to apply the same standard to Southern soldiers. But it's not true anyway, so... And there you go. Ooh. Checkmate, Lincolnites. That's the name of the program. You want to talk about the moral tariff? Let's talk about the moral tariff. Put very simply, it was a reaction to the Panic of 1857, yep. and yep. it was meant to jumpstart the nation's struggling economy. Yeah, the, the, as I said before, the Panic of 1857 was the result of a tariff bill that was very favorable to the South, and it was trying to undo the damage that was done by that tariff by kind of taking things back a notch, helping the economy to recover from that, and it's a ridiculous argument to say that was the cause of the Civil War. It may have aided your Hamiltonian industries, but not our Jeffersonian agriculture. Y'all were just trying to develop your New England factories into something that would rival the profitable and well-established factories of Britain. Meanwhile, you had Pennsylvanians in particular, but many Northern industrialists, petitioning the government to make it more favorable for them, financially beneficial for them. The whole affair reeked of nepotism and corruption. <laughs> Furthermore, I- You're right. I am? Yes. That is what happened. Wait, we actually agree on something? Yes, the moral tariff was unquestionably favorable for northern interests and detrimental to southern yeah. ones. Oh. But it wasn't passed through Congress until March of 1861. Right. And if southern states had... So the, the House, I think, had passed it already, but I think the Democrats still controlled the Senate. Uh, in 1860 and so it was put on in the plans to be voted on in december of 1860 after the elections uh because the assumption was that the senate would be more favorable to the republicans at that time and it would be easier to pass that started seceding in december of 1860 then there's no fucking way it would have gotten passed so rather than being the cause of secession the moral tariff happened as a result of secession. And more tariffs then followed because they needed to pay for the war. So they added even more tariffs after that on top of that. Uh, so he's right uh, to a degree. The moral tariff was going to be voted on. It was already being planned to be voted on before the secession started. So whether or not it could have passed or not, I don't know. Um, in fact, I want to look this up because I want to be sure. I think he might be a little off on that one. Okay, I stand corrected. Uh, after the withdrawal of those seven southern states and their senators, uh, the Republicans were able to take control of the Senate in February, uh, and that gave them the ability to pass it. They passed it 25 uh, to 14, almost completely on party lines. One Democrat from Pennsylvania, 10 Southern Democrats opposed it, um, two Northern Democrats and two Far West Democrats. Uh, Buchanan actually favored the bill because it helped the interest of his home state. Pennsylvania was one of his last acts in office. So, all right, there you go. Hmm. In any case, it was just one of many grievances that Southern Democrats had with Northern Republicans. The principal one was the Republican stance on slavery. Saying the Civil War was only about slavery is ignorant. The Civil War was extremely complicated. What about the tariff of 1861? I literally just All the dozens of newspapers speaking of a tax war. Most historians agree that the Civil War was too complicated to tear. What about the 70% of men who didn't own slaves and fought for what? Well, at least we got the percentage of slave owners right this time. Those newspapers you're referring to were mainly British rags, like the London Times. The Brits, they had a vested interest in keeping that transatlantic cotton trade going yep. to fuel their own industries. Naturally, they sided with the Southern Democrats who were all about free trade. and they. So here's the deal with the South. And, I mean, the argument would be, well, wait a second. You know, the Republicans, they, their platform did not call for the end to slavery. They, Lincoln included, they opposed the expansion of slavery. But the problem was that slavery by its nature... Um, it needed to keep expanding because, and this is complicated, we've talked about it in other times, 
the whole nature of politics for the first 80 years of the United States was about the balance of power between slave and free states. And very often you had every time a new slave state entered the union, a new free state entered the union. So the number of senators from slave states and free states stayed balanced so that neither side could impose its will on the other. Uh, that ch began to change when you have the Fugitive Slave Act given as a bone to the Confederacy when another slave, uh, free state enters and the balance gets changed. And if you have a, a brand new party that's never been in the White House before coming to power saying we're not going to let it expand anymore, the Southerners are seeing that as the first step towards the death of slavery. Because it's only a matter of time before you add a couple of more free states and you're not allowing the expansion of slave states, which means eventually the votes are going to be there to abolish slavery. And they're just thinking down the road. That's what they think is going to happen. And so they're reacting to that. Shared their criticisms of the moral tariff, which was extremely protective. The Confederate government desperately needed British assistance if they had any hope of winning the war. Yep. So they encouraged that myth that the war was being fought over taxes. Britain, of course, being very anti-slavery at the time. Excellent point he makes. Uh, the British Empire had abolished slavery completely, uh, I think around 1830 or so, maybe a couple years after that. Um, effectively abolished, at least in, in Britain itself, around the turn of the century. When the slave trade was abolished, it, it, it was... If not by law, it was kind of de facto not okay anymore in Britain. Um, and he's right. Uh, the Confederacy absolutely 100% could not win that war without uh, foreign intervention, just like the United States couldn't have won the revolution without foreign intervention. Uh, the South needed much the same kind of thing to happen. And it was in their interest to spin this war as about anything other than preserving slavery. Uh, for the sake of getting that help. He's 100% right about that. But some British abolitionists knew better. The philosopher John Stuart Mill wrote an opinion piece in a pro-union newspaper in 1862 in which he correctly stated, There is a theory in England that on the side of the North, the question is not one of slavery at all. The North, it seems, have no more objection to slavery than the South have. Their leaders never say one word implying disapprobation of it. They are ready, on the contrary, to give it new guarantees, to renounce all that they have been contending for, to win back, if opportunity offers, the South to the Union by surrendering the whole point. 100% right. Uh, remember, the, the, the war aim for the North was not to get rid of slavery. It was preserve the Union. We'll deal with slavery later. We'll deal with that issue. In fact, there was a bill uh, that was working its way through Congress that would have offered guarantees, as he's mentioning here, to slavery. Promises to the South that they weren't going to abolish their slavery if they would just return to the Union peacefully, but they weren't willing to do that. If this be the true state of the case, what are the Southern chiefs fighting about? Their apologists in England say that it is about tariffs and similar trumpery. They say nothing of the kind. They tell the world, and they told their own citizens when they wanted their votes, that the object of the fight was slavery. Yep. The world knows what the question between the North and South has been for many years, and still is. Slavery alone was thought of, alone talked of. Slavery was battled for and against, on the floor of Congress and in the plains of Kansas. Yep. On the slavery question exclusively was the party constituted, which now rules the United States. On slavery, Fremont was rejected. On slavery, Lincoln was elected. Fremont was the Republican nominee for president in 1856, and then Lincoln is the nominee in 1860. The South separated on slavery and proclaimed slavery as the one cause of separation. Yep. He goes on to predict that as the war continued, the cause of preserving the Union would become inseparable from the cause of abolishing slavery. That came to pass yep. when Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation. After that, as a direct result of that, the British public became very uncomfortable with the idea of supporting the Confederacy. And it was absolutely a reason for Lincoln. Listen, we can't 100% know what Lincoln's motives were. Lincoln was a pragmatic guy. He was a brilliant politician. Maybe one of the most brilliant politicians we've ever had in the office of president. He knew what was possible and he knew where the line was. And he would push it when he could. But he also understood he didn't have the power, the authority, the ability, or the mandate to eliminate slavery until the war gave him an opportunity. But even then, he could only push it so far. He knew he had to keep the border states, because remember, the North still has slavery. Maryland, uh, by force, but Delaware, uh, Kentucky, and Missouri 
are slave states that have remained in the Union. He's got to keep them in the Union. So he's not going to push them away. So the Emancipation Proclamation seems like kind of a half measure, but it absolutely kept any idea that the British might have gotten involved in the war. It eliminated that once and for all. Uh, so it was a brilliant foreign policy move, as well as being a domestic tool for depriving the South of their slaves and moving the nation in the direction of abolition. In your eagerness to blame white people in every video you make, you've forgotten about the nullification crisis. South Carolina nearly rebelled during Andrew Jackson's presidency over just such a protectionist tariff. That's true, but as John C. Calhoun himself pointed out in 1830, I consider the Tariff Act as the occasion rather than the real cause of the present unhappy state of things. The truth can no longer be disguised that the peculiar domestic institution of the southern states and the consequent direction which that and her soil have given to her industry has placed them in regard to taxation and appropriations in opposite relation to the majority of the Union. So in summary, protective tariffs were a big point of contention between North and South leading up to the Civil War, but it was ancillary to and directly influenced by the South's dependency on slave labor. Yep. Which they would do anything to preserve and defend. Yep, yep, you yep. You can eat shit. If the North was so damn noble, why did the same damned army that invaded the South kill the American Indians? Sounds like bullshit to oh, me. So we're back why on, don't back on what about us? Listen, make your case without saying, but they did a bad thing too. Unless it's the same bad thing, okay? If you want to make the argument against the North, say, hey, they still own slaves. But, nah, it's Plus, what about instead of for sure. playing with yourself, stop whining because we have had so much pro-union, one-sided crap. You get triggered when the tiger side is allowed to have their say. The South U.S. everywhere south of the Canadian border. Both oh. sides were pro-slavery, but Confederacy just never lied oh. about it. Now I'm gonna bring some Confederate Ooh. flag waving Whoa. hip hop tub and black dance party. Wait, did we run out of comments? Tubs creating the ultimate dilemma. I think we ran you out of comments. You can pretend you can blame Listen, man. everybody behind the rebel flag <laughs> is racist. You know, I have a meaningful connection with human beings. But we enjoy hip hop. Play outside or some shit. Over that mumble I'll see you rap later. BS Bye. <laughs> I'll give him credit. This is a brilliant way to deal with stupid comments. I get them too, and I love how my friend JD over in the History Underground deals with them. He usually just posts them, and he, he, he protects their their identity. I wouldn't do that. I occasionally get some, and I feel like shaming them, but more often than not, I just hide them because they're stupid. I feel like that went well. <laughs> All right, that was good. 100% right. Uh, I, I can't disagree with anything he said. So let me know your thoughts. Use the comment section below. Keep it civil. Keep it to the truth. Check out the links to my other reactions to Checkmate Lincolnites. We'll see you again soon. Thanks for watching.